This is CBC Here and Now. A confrontation is believed to have occurred between the officers and a man who was subject to the complaint that resulted in one of the responding officers discharging his sidearm. I would like to offer my sincere condolences to the family of the man who was involved in this tragic incident. Fatal shooting in Cornerbrook, a man killed last night after an RNC officer shot him. The Ontario Provincial Police now investigating. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Well, it is our top story. An on-duty officer shot and killed a man last night in Cornerbrook. It happened a short time after two officers responded to what they call a criminal complaint in a suburban part of the city. Here and Now's Colleen Connors is live outside the house tonight. What is the latest, Colleen? Well, Debbie, I'm standing in the driveway of 19 Carriage Lane, a very large white house that happens to be a rental unit. And behind that police car that you see behind me in around the corner, that is the apartment where we believe this shooting took place. At 1130 last night, a man inside was shot and killed. Take a look at what it looked like much earlier this morning here at this scene. A police car on site, much like there was tonight. And here is what we know. Police officers who were working last night responded to a call of a criminal complaint. There was a confrontation of sorts that led to one officer firing his sidearm. The man who was shot was brought to the hospital here in Cornerbrook and pronounced dead at 12.30 this morning. Now it will take time to find out exactly what that confrontation was all about and that's because of a couple of reasons. Police have to wait on a report from the chief medical examiner and that autopsy is scheduled for tomorrow. And because this involved RNC officers in Cornerbrook, the investigation into the death, well that's going to be carried out by the Ontario Provincial Police. Have a listen now to what Chief Boland had to say to the media literally just moments ago. On Tuesday evening, just after 11.30 p.m., patrol officers in Cornerbrook responded to a residence on Carriage Lane in response to a criminal complaint. A short time after arriving, a confrontation is believed to have occurred between the officers and a man who was subject to the complaint that resulted in one of the responding officers discharging his sidearm. The man, who we are not identifying at this time, was conveyed to Western Memorial Regional Hospital, where he was pronounced deceased at approximately 12.30 a.m. Now, Colleen, you were first on the scene at 6 o'clock this morning. What are people there saying about this shooting? Well, neighbours are really shocked that something like this could happen in their neighbourhood. One woman even told me, she lives just down the road, that she wants to move off the street because of all of this. So this incident took part, it took place inside this door, inside the apartment earlier th uh, this morning, pardon me. Surprisingly, neighbors, you know, they didn't hear anything from what I know. They didn't hear a gunshot. They didn't hear police sirens or any emergency vehicles. Some people who live nearby this house said that the couple who lived in this apartment fought frequently saying they could hear fighting and yelling at times. This is a residential area of town, a suburban area. There's lots of families that live here, uh, some, even some newer homes. It's quite a residential area. So people can't believe that there was a shooting here on this street uh, in quiet West Coast city of Cornerbrook. And now the public will have to wait to find out exactly what happened at this house. With an external investigation going on, there's one thing we should let you know, that the two officers who were involved will be on leave or they'll be assigned to administrative duties while this investigation goes on. Now Boland says that this is just standard procedure. Both of the officers involved in this incident are presently on leave and will be assigned to administrative duties upon their return to work while the investigation by the OPP is ongoing. Placing an officer on leave or administrative duties should not be taken as a sign that the police service believes that the officers did anything wrong. Regardless of the circumstances, any officer in the same situation will be placed on leave and assigned to administrative duties. Now, Bolin says that this is a tragic event. Those are the words he used today. And he says it's critical for the officer and the man involved here to have a thorough and transparent investigation. So while there is still an external investigation going on, the RNC will conduct their own internal review. Live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now.
Now, as Colleen said, police addressed reporters making a brief statement at RNC headquarters just an hour ago. Continuing our live coverage, Ariana Kellen joins us from there right now. So, Ariana, what more can you tell us about uh, what Police Chief Bolin had to say? of the man who was shot was not released, not even his age. In fact, Chief Joe Boland wouldn't answer questions from the media following his statement today, citing the fact that this is now an OPP investigation. It is out of the hands of the RNC. But his message to the public today was clear. It was for patience. I have been advised that the Ontario Provincial Police will conduct this investigation, which will be re reviewed once complete by the Al Alberta Serious Incident Response Team. It is critical for the officer, the family of the victim, and the community that a fair, transparent, and thorough investigation takes place. I ask the community to have faith in our abilities and to have patience as we work with the OPP and ACERT to find answers following this tragic event. Now, if you live in Corner Brook, you know that this is not the first time that there has been a police-involved fatal shooting in the city. We're going to give you a look back at some of the historical police shooting cases in this province. But first, a warning, some of what you're about to see may be disturbing to some. In 1996, an intoxicated Nicholas Bento fires a shot in front of his father's home on the Bjorn Peninsula. RCMP officers fired three shots, killing him. Four years pass without incident. Then, in late August 2000, RCMP get a call about a man in Little Catalina threatening children. What they didn't know was that 43-year-old Norman Reed was schizophrenic and would often skip his meds. Reed lifted an axe over his head and headed for police. He'd never reached them. Police shot him five times. Seven weeks later, a devastatingly familiar scenario. 23-year-old Daryl Power needed help from health professionals. He was depressed and anxious. When police arrived at his mother's Cornerbrook apartment, he ran at them with a knife. Police shot him three times. Easter Sunday, 2015, an officer visits the home of Don Dunphy in Mitchell's Brook. A conversation over tweets gets heated, the officer says, and Dunphy points a loaded rifle. Four shots dead. Inquiries have examined how and why these police shootings have happened. It offered recommendations and suggestions on how to prevent it from happening again. What outcome this shooting will make remains to be seen. Now, we do know that in this case, the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team will investigate the findings of the OPP. So what about Newfoundland and Labrador's own CERT, or Serious Incident Response Team? The Justice Minister is saying tonight that the province will be advertising for the position of a director of the province's own CERT soon, not soon enough to investigate this latest police shooting. Reporting live from RNC headquarters, I'm Arianna Kellen for Here and Now. Everybody here is just itching to get back into the mines and start doing what they're really good at. A reboot for Wabush Mines means hundreds of jobs are up for grabs. We take you to Takora's crowded job fair coming up. The high winds are keeping Marine Atlantic ferries tied up in port and that's leading to backlogs on both sides of the Cabot Strait. Corporation says about 110 trucks are waiting in North Sydney and even more, 150 in Port of Basque. There are also about 80 passengers on both sides. And yet with more bad weather on the way, those numbers are expected to grow. The marine forecast calling for some pretty strong winds and wave heights as well. Marine Atlantic says it's possible crossings will not resume until Friday. So we can actually talk about that uh, situation with uh, you could probably guess who's about to join <laughs> us. Yeah, sounds very messy and it's not over yet. It's definitely not over. It's just starting, actually. We've got uh, strong winds already for the uh, Rec House area, right. as you just mentioned. If you take a look at those numbers, about 120 kilometers per hour has been uh, the top number so far for Rec House. Looking at gusts near 140 kilometers per hour overnight. That will continue as we head through the morning hours as well. If we take a look at the watches and warnings across Newfoundland, 
it's uh, looking a lot of red and a lot of orange, which means we've got those wind warnings up through Gross Morn, down along uh, the south coast through to even St. John's under that wind warning. Could see gusts of 110 to 120 kilometers per hour, and then a number of winter storm warnings. Now, uh, it does look likely that we'll see significant snowfall for parts of central as we head towards the Avalon. That forecast gets a little bit more dicey, but I'll have all the details coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the City of St. John's is looking for your feedback to help improve Metro bus services. Bus officials set up shop in the Student Centre at Memorial University today to ask students and faculty what people want in the service. Mun is entertaining the possibility of creating a U-Pass program, which would give students access to discounted rates and expanded bus routes. But just how that would work is still up in the air. I think it's really exciting that the city is looking at improving transit. I think it's it's desperately needed here. We've become way too car-centric a culture, and it's very difficult to get around here. Um, even though it's a small city, you, you should be able to actually move around quite easily without a car. An update today on the White Rose oil spill. This map, provided by Husky Energy, shows the area the company is monitoring. And as you can see, the offshore rig is 350 kilometers offshore. As of today, Husky says it's completed 11 observation flights over the area since the spill was reported nearly two weeks ago. Six vessels are now examining the situation on the water and subsea ROVs are surveying the area. The boats are positioned near the spill, monitoring for any activity. So far, Husky says 18 birds have been oiled as a result of the spill. Well, it is the largest oil spill in our province's history, and today during question period in Ottawa, the pressure was put on the Prime Minister when he was asked what his Liberal government plans to do about abysmal response times for spills like the one in White Rose. There are historic investments in an ocean protections plan of $1.5 billion. We'll work with local, local communities, uh, partner with top scientists, uh, partner with Indigenous communities and demonstrate uh, that we have the capacity to respond uh, to spills uh, and to protect our coasts and the livelihood of those who depend on them. We know that there's always more work to do, but we have focused on investing uh, smartly, on trusting science uh, and working in partnership with provinces, municipalities and Indigenous people uh, to keep our oceans safe. To the big land now, Labrador West is buzzing with news of the Wabush Mines reboot. Yesterday, Takora Resources announced that it plans to reopen the Scully Mine in Wabush. So with nearly 300 jobs up for grabs, people packed into the Arts and Culture Centre to hear about potential job prospects. Here now is Jacob Barker has more. The theatre was filled to capacity to hear from Takora. Hopeful job seekers were lined up out the doors. Curiosity abound for what happens now with the restart of Wabush Mines. I don't know, hopefully find some good news about uh, employment, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> hopefully hook a job, you know? Well, I came out to uh, look for a job in my profession, which is public relations, so I'm just hoping that I can fill a role there that's needed and get hired. <laughs> Huge showing. There's a lot of interest in this, eh? Yes, very much so. I'm not surprised at all. Why? Why aren't you spread? Well, it's a mining community, and it's very passionate. And everybody here is just itching to get back into the mines and start doing what they're really good at. Suppliers were there too, just as interested to see what the future holds for Wabush Mines. It's, it's good. We've done some work already with with Takora over the last couple of years, getting some of their equipment assembled and serviced and, and inspected or whatnot so ah, it looks good it looks good it looks really good for the community you feel like you're going to be busier now we hope we certainly thought that we'd have uh, at least the place half full uh, but but very excited to see the interest and uh, look it, it, it says a lot about uh, what we're about to take on and what it means to the community workers from the mine who were laid off when it shut down about four years ago will not be recalled but Decora is encouraging those with experience at the mines to apply for these jobs. The company says it's looking for versatile employees. The type of employee we're looking for. So we want people that are willing to be multi-skilled and uh, multi-task, uh, which will give us a competitive advantage uh, at work. As far as a timeline for when Decora will start the hiring process, 
It says it hopes to fill some positions within a couple of months by January, but the biggest portion of the workforce they plan to have hired on for March. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Labrador West. Eastern Health is looking at standardizing its medical records. It comes just a year after a national report found death rates for heart surgery patients in this province to be as much as two or three times higher than the national average. But the health authority says those stats are not correct. It says record keeping is to blame. Here and as Katie Breen explains. In here, with the chest cavity open, surgeons are precise delicately working a small space to save or make a life better. But outside the OR, on their notepads, precision slips. Doctors aren't exactly known for having perfect penmanship, and that's an issue according to Eastern Health and the groups that compiled the national report. Data from this province is incomplete. The people computing it, they're going off handwritten notes, notes in the margins, and they're missing key information, like if a patient had other illnesses. If you don't calculate all those features or capture all those in your documentation, you won't get an accurate outcome at the end of the day. When the stats came out last year, the province ordered an external review. A doctor heading a cardiology program in BC came for a week in April. What Dr. Fredette found was he had no concerns about the care that we provide. But he did notice that the way that we generate our report cards, or the way that we measure how we do, did have some areas of improvement that we could start to work on. Eastern Health says, for privacy reasons, we can't see the full report. But it did provide CBC with the report's recommendations. Standardization is weaved through the list. Instead of a bunch of people coding or inputting information from departments all over the hospital, have them specialize in specific areas. Have doctors use the same terminology so there's less confusion. And standardize patient charts. What we'd like to see is that we're less and less dependent on handwritten notes and what we scratch in margins and, and we want standardized checklists like an airline pilot that's out on the runway that takes off. Eastern Health says it's working on that kind of electronic checklist now. Dr. Connor says it could be implemented in the cardiology department within the next six months and if it works there, it could be expanded into other departments. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Unsealed cannabis cannot be stored anywhere in the vehicle that is accessible to a driver or any other occupant in the vehicle, such as the glove box. Get the lowdown on traveling with cannabis. What you can and can't do, next. Some axe throwers from St. John's are heading to the World Championships in Chicago. I'm Jeremy and I'll have that story coming up.
Welcome back. Going to dispense with the niceties. <laughs> take it away, Ashley. Yeah. We've got a lot to talk about. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about today. If we take a look at the current satellite radar, we can see that that system is right on the doorstep, already starting to see that uh, precipitation push through the Buren and the southern Avalon, as well as the south coast. Now, uh, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see that system right now and how large it is. It's actually going to uh, continue to strengthen as we head through the night tonight. And there's a lot of uncertainty as far as the forecast goes. But here's a look at those watches and warnings again. Uh, wind warnings along the west coast, south coast as well, including uh, Buren all the way through to St. John's. And then we've got that winter storm warning as well. Now, it is a good bet that we're going to see uh, significant accumulation for parts of central. But as we head towards the Avalon, that's when things get a little bit dicey. So here's a look at those uh, numbers as far as temperatures go tonight. And those are going to play a role in what type of precipitation we're going to see as well. So uh, sitting in the single digits, just above zero for parts of central. Uh, Marystown looking at about three degrees tonight, two for St. John's. Those winds are really going to ramp up as we head through the night tonight. Port of Basque and uh, the Rec House area looking at uh, gusts near 140 kilometers per hour now up through Labrador not a whole lot happening still looking at that potential for some freezing drizzle for Happy Valley Goose Bay towards the coast Nain's actually going to see that temperature jump up to minus one by morning and then still looking at a wind chill near minus 14 for Lab City uh, into tomorrow though that's when we're going to see the strongest winds and you can see that uh, with these arrows here otherwise that strong snow or heavy snow rather for parts of central temperatures hovering around zero degrees and then jumping up for Buren and the Avalon looking at temperatures hovering around the five degree mark and then single digits along the coast up through Labrador. Not a whole lot of change in the forecast from today. Uh, likely seeing some sunshine through Nain and minus one, but some freezing drizzle possible for uh, along the coast again and through Happy Valley Goose Bay, Lab City sitting at minus four. So let's take a look at that future tracker and where we're going to see that precipitation. Heaviest snow, as I kept mentioning or keep mentioning, is for central. Where it starts to get dicey is uh, for parts of the Buren. So anything north around Terrenceville looking at that heavy snow. And then for the northern Avalon as well, we're looking at uh, somewhere between 10, maybe even 20 centimeters of snow by the time tomorrow afternoon rolls around. And then even some wet snow possible for uh, St. John's metro area and then through uh, parts of the southern Avalon as well. That will continue to track further north and then things should change over to rain by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. It's the winds really that are the story with this system. So anywhere where we're seeing those strong uh, or heavy snow, we could see blowing snow with that as well. So here's a look at uh, the timing for that. We'll see those winds pick up tonight into tomorrow uh, or rather overnight tonight, anywhere between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour through the day tomorrow. Those winds will ease quite significantly for uh, the northern Avalon. You see dropping right down light into the afternoon and then they're going to pick back up for Friday and then uh, stay strong right into Saturday as well. So I'll nail down uh, the amount of precipitation that's going to happen when I come back in a little bit. Anthony. Well, tonight we have a new feature for you from our CBC Investigates team. The lowdown has got consumer tips and kind of news that you can use. And for our first one, Jen White looks into tips from the RCMP about the rules around transporting cannabis. So here's the lowdown. So you've just bought some cannabis from a store in Newfoundland and Labrador. Here's the lowdown from the RCMP about how to get this home safely and legally. You can have a maximum of 30 grams of dried cannabis on you, either in public or in a vehicle. No person is allowed to consume cannabis within a vehicle, whether it's the driver or any other occupant. If the container is sealed, you can keep it anywhere in your car. But if that seal is broken, or if it's cannabis that you've grown at home, it has to be out of reach. Unsealed cannabis cannot be stored anywhere in the vehicle that is accessible to a driver or any other occupant in the vehicle, such as the glove box. A suggested place to store your unsealed cannabis would be here in the back of the trunk. But the rules are different if you're paying for transportation. If somebody is paying for a fare such as a taxi or a bus, they can carry their cannabis whether it's sealed or unsealed on their person. 
Canada's lower risk cannabis use guidelines suggest not getting behind the wheel for at least six hours after consuming cannabis. Give yourself a lot of time to make sure that that has uh, left your system and is no longer impairing your ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. And if you break the rules, here's what to expect next. If we pull somebody over and they perform the standardized field sobriety tests at roadside and are found to be impaired, they will be arrested and brought back to the detachment for further testing through a drug recognition evaluation. If they subsequently fail that testing procedure, they will be charged with impaired operation by a drug and they'll receive a driver's license suspension, vehicle impoundment and a follow up with a court date. Now we'll give you the lowdown on another topic next week on Here and Now. It seems the axe has taken a turn. It's no longer seen as just a backyard tool. It's broken out and become its own sport. Axe throwing is now practiced all around the world. And as Jeremy Eden explains, three men from this province are training for the World Championships. As a teenager in Placentia Bay, Clem Whittle chopped wood with his brothers. But when their father wasn't around, they used the axes for something different. We would, for fun, uh, throw axes at trees to see who could stick it in, and we keep getting smaller trees and smaller trees, and and you know stuff like that. Just just for but we wouldn't let Dad catch us because if you broke an axe handle, you were in trouble. It was on a whim that Whittle started throwing at Jack Axes this fall, and it turned out all that practice with his brothers years ago paid off. At 60 years old, he's heading to the World Axe Throwing Championships in Chicago. This is my first league this fall, and to end up winning the, uh, you know, the, the, the league uh, final this year, was, it's just too funny. Whittle will be joined in Chicago by Anthony McDonald, who also fell in love with the sport at Jack Axis. This will be his second international competition this year after finishing fourth at the U.S. Open this summer. I think we all started in the Winter League and there was nothing else to do. Uh, we came down a lot, we threw a lot of axes, and uh, you can come here most nights, you'll find one of us here. The World Championships will hit a bigger audience. ESPN is televising part of the axe throwing action. I feel the same way going down to this one I did last time. I just want to place, I want to make it the ESPN2 would be nice. So I got to make the top 32 to get on the uh, ESPN network, not just the website. So that'll be kind of cool. If all goes well, there will be one more Newfoundlander joining them. Ryan Lane is hoping to win himself a wild card slot at the tournament. I think it's partly the competitiveness is nice, but it's also the people here. It's a really interesting group, and there's no uh, there's no drama or anything like that. Everyone wants to see everyone else do really well, so it's uh, it's a nice environment, and it's fun to throw axes. The three axe throwers will continue to practice their skills here at Jack Axes up until the big event in December, and while bragging rights are on the line, there's also a top prize of five thousand dollars, big money for throwing some axes. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Uh, how many times are you going to subject the audience to that? We get it, Jeremy. You threw the axe. <laughs> Four <Yeah>. times. <laughs> I understand it took like 15 takes for yeah. him to get that. Well, so. he got the, the one shot. <laughs> the that one that mattered. <laughs> People used to ask me, oh, you're, you're that guy who used to, you know, wear the cowboy hat and get on stage and jump all over the place. And I said, yeah, I'll be back. It's just not the right time yet. But now's the time. He's hitting the road again. Rod Jackson's country career comes full circle, and he sits down with Debbie. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Rod Jackson is taking another shot. The country music singer, originally from Grand Falls, Windsor, has stepped back onto the stage after walking away from the music industry more than a decade ago. But this time, he doesn't have dreams of Nashville on his mind. Rod Jackson was an up-and-coming country singer. In the late 90s and early 2000s, he was getting a lot of attention, snagging both Music NL and ECMA awards. He was Country Artist of the Year at the Music NL Awards in 2005. He was working with a manager and had Nashville in his sights. But then suddenly, he took off his trademark cowboy hat and left the industry. Now Jackson is singing again. He and his band, The Perfect Strangers, have a new video that's racking up lots of views online. After a salmon festival appearance this summer and a provincial tour, they're about to hit the road again. But first, he sat down with me to talk about coming full circle with his music. So Rod, how does it feel to be back on stage and behind that microphone? Sounds awesome, <laughs> it feels awesome. Uh, I got a great bunch of people around me. Uh, the people haven't forgotten me, so I'm quite happy. Does it feel like you've been away for such a long period of time? Sometimes it does, yeah. uh, but not really, because when you get on stage and you get the crowd excited, it feels the same way it did 15 years ago. Well, take us back to 15 years ago. I mean, you really had a good thing going at that point in your career. Yes. The possibilities were endless, and you stepped away. Why? Well, it just stopped being fun for me, Debbie. It, 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 it wasn't, I didn't have the joy that I had had in the beginning mm -hmm. to, to perform and to play. I had been offered a tour of the U.S., uh, opening for a big name, we'll say. And, uh, you know, I had my house, I had my wife, I had my two kids. And I said, do I really want to travel and be in some hotel room in God knows where and not be able to see my daughter going to class in the mornings? And I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's a tough business, too. It's isn't tough. It? And then the, when I said, well, you know, that's great. I have a full band. How am I going to get paid? And they said, well, it's all about exposure. I said, <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Yeah. You, you couldn't do Not it. in my situation. Mm -hmm. I, I started out, I got in the music business as a fundraiser for the Arthritis Society I was really involved with. And um, you have arthritis. Yes, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when I got involved in the music business, I was in a sales management job with an oil company. Uh, and I did this as a fundraiser. So all of a sudden, all these wonderful things were happening. And I was touring and playing music videos and playing shows all over the place with the biggest names. Um, and that was all great, but after a while, after you have managers for a few years telling you where to go and how to get there and how to sing and all of a sudden what shirt to wear and what <laughs> this to do, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm too independent. Hmm. I, I'm too stubborn to, to put up with that. And I stepped back and I focused on my business. I focused on raising my daughter, myself and my wife uh, and my son and I never regretted it, not a bit. Well, here you are today. You're back at it. Yes. Why now? Yes. I turned 50. I was a guest on a tour uh, last year. Uh, the tour went really well. I, I said, you know what? It's time to get it back. And I always knew I would be back. I never put it away forever. But now's the time. You did say no regrets. But I'm just wondering, in the back of your mind sometimes, do you think, I could have made it big? Uh, success is relative, Debbie. If, if, if I had gone away and lost my wife and my kids, then what am I? So, you know, I don't even think about it. So let's talk about the tour. Uh, you've been rehearsing, uh, <laughs> getting ready for this Christmas tour. I understand you're driving your family crazy oh, with Christmas songs. Oh, <laughs> I was barbecuing in August, and I'm, and because I don't, don't even know I'm doing it, because the songs are just flowing through my head, and, and I'm thinking about them, and I'm just singing away probably a Jim Reeves song or an Elvis Presley song. And my daughter said, Dad, you just gotta stop. You're driving me crazy. Don't, please don't. Sing something else. 
Well, for the next couple of weeks, starting on the 1st, you are going to be singing an awful lot of Christmas songs. Yes. Um, how are you feeling as you prepare for this tour? Are you anxious? Or no. what, what's the inner feelings that you have? I, I like to tell myself that I got out of the stress business a long time ago. So for me, I get excited now. It's like these people have paid good money to come and see our show. So I want it to be the best show that we can ever put off. Well, I want to wish you and the perfect strangers the best of luck. Thanks for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. There you go. He, yeah. He's a pretty interesting yeah. guy. Yeah, eh? obviously someone who got his priorities set and now back in the music scene. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if you were wondering, he has opened for some uh, people and uh, groups you'd know, Tragically Hip, okay. um, <laughs> Cochranelli, Furtado, Biggies. and uh, country legend Gene Watson and mm -hmm. Toby Keith. There you go. Pretty busy guy. Mm -hmm. If you want to check out his tour schedule, just go to his Facebook page, Rod Jackson and the Perfect Strangers. In the time leading up to the sanction of the project, did you feel that you had a competent team working for you at Nelcor? The question of competency comes to the floor at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry. We'll bring you the answer next. An Alcor executive responsible for the Muskrat Falls project faced some direct questions from the lawyer who represents Kathy Dunderdale, the former premier today. Lawyer Aaron Best cross-examined Gilbert Bennett after the inquiry heard questions about the qualifications of the project team. There were also questions about what Nalcor did or didn't tell the government about the costs and risks of the mega project. In the time leading up to the sanction of the project, did you feel that you had a competent team working for you at Nalcor? Uh, absolutely. And if you saw areas where your team lacked experience or expertise, did you look outside to consultants to fill those gaps? So many of the, many of the key people in these roles uh, came in as consultants uh, with previous experience. So we were, you know, drawing on our internal resources, we were looking for consultants uh, and a mix of both in order to fill the needs that we had. And then the project team 
don't have that thinking uh, well established. At the time of sanction, did you have confidence in the project cost estimates? Um, the, co the cost estimates were completed by a competent consultant uh, who has extensive experience, and uh, I felt that they were the appropriate people to do that job. So therefore, yes, I did have confidence in the estimates. Thank you. And at the time of sanction, did you believe that you were successfully mitigating the risks associated with the project? We were working hard on mitigating those, and uh, yes, I thought we were going to uh, successfully mitigate them. Thank you. At the time of sanction, did you feel that NALCOR had provided all the information to government that it needed from NALCOR to make the sanction decision? I believe that that information was flowing to government, yes, that necessary, absolutely necessary information. And Thank I you. think that the, you know, the, the details and how we execute, uh, while there are detailed information and topics and concepts that were being carefully considered by NALCOR, uh, I, I felt that government was you know, receiving information at the appropriate level and understanding uh, the key risks. Turning now to Botwood, where Mural Arts Society got together today to celebrate the completion of a meaningful mural. It celebrates the 125th anniversary of the community's Newfoundland Railway and features two local boys with a family connection. Here now is Garrett Barry. Talk to the young man, men behind it. That's you. So what are you, what, what, what are you doing? You have a penny in your hand? Yes. Yes. And what are you doing with the penny in the picture? Putting it on the track. And why would you put a penny on the track in the picture? For the, the train to roll over it. And what would happen if a train rolled over a penny? Mm, they would stop. Obviously the affiliation with the railway track and family being uh, associated with the, our grandfather driving the last train out and a great grandfather uh, driving one of the first trains that came into the community. Uh, and my mother is obviously with the Mural Arts Society so they were looking for the appropriate people to be on the mural and it just came to land in our lap with it. It is from putting my, my ear right down to a track seen the train. Now have you ever seen a train in real life? Yeah. Yeah. And well, how big is a train? Yay big. <laughs> this big. This big. <laughs> and have you ever heard a train? Have you ever done what you're doing in the picture? No. No. Well, you know, it's it's going to be definitely part of our family to, you know, let them know what they were part of and what it was and to keep the memory and, you know, the memory of the family and the railway uh, in the forefront of their mind, basically. And hopefully they'll, the level of comprehension will continue as they get a little bit older.
Welcome back once again. So Ashley, uh, how much snow is expected? Well, we're looking at uh, quite a bit of snow for Newfoundland. Uh, it's not going to affect parts of Labrador. We already have tons of snow, so you can sit <laughs> this one out. Uh, but if we take a look at the forecast for snowfall, uh, as we head through the night tonight, it's a quite significant number. This is through tomorrow morning. Look at those numbers, somewhere between uh, 20 to 30 centimeters in some cases. Now, where that tricky, that forecast gets a little bit tricky is uh, for eastern Newfoundland and parts of the Avalon. I showed you those numbers before as far as temperature temperatures go and that's really going to play a, a part into how much snow actually falls and if you take a look at uh, Carbonier looking at 37 centimeters and then 20 centimeters for Bay Roberts so any shift in this forecast could mean a significant amount either uh, east or west of this area St. John showing about five centimeters of snow by the time tomorrow morning rolls around but we are also looking at that mixing with rain at some points as well now heading towards the rest of uh, into Friday so we're going to see the majority of the snowfall for central anywhere from 25 to 35 centimeters is a good bet for central up through uh, Bay Verde as well gander showing about 30 centimeters by the time uh, Friday afternoon rolls around. So if we take a look at the rainfall amounts as I mentioned going to mix with rain especially for uh, parts of the Buren showing about 40 millimeters of rain for Marystown and then uh, Trapassi as well and then St. John's about 40 millimeters of rain so 40 millimeters of rain plus five centimeters of snow uh, through the overnight so it does look quite messy so if we take a look at uh, what we're expecting as far as future tracker goes on Thursday in or Thursday night into Friday that system hangs around and then we're going to see that snow continue for the most part for parts of central and then head uh, towards the Avalon as well so we could see that mix back over again to either rain or snow uh, through the day on Friday everywhere else kind of just looking at cloudy periods maybe some lingering flurries as well and we're looking at that up through Labrador into the overnight as well so here's a look at the forecast temperature dipping for Nain minus seven through Friday minus five for Lab City likely a nice day there looking at plenty of sunshine and then flurries heading towards Cartwright otherwise uh, a nice day across uh, the coast west coast just looking at a uh, mix of sun and cloud or more cloudy periods and then four degrees still for Marystown so that's going to be rain and then St. John's either rain or snow as that temperature hovers around two degrees so looking ahead a little bit not a whole lot happening into Saturday Sunday definitely looks like the best day of the weekend and then in towards Monday see another system move in that's when more snow will be on the way for Labrador so take a quick look at your five-day forecast uh, temperatures not really moving much over the next couple of days hovering between zero and five degrees uh, central Newfoundland will see a nice weekend for the most part on Sunday and minus one temperatures dipping overnight into the minus single digits same goes for western Newfoundland slight chance of some flurries late day on Sunday continuing into Monday and then that's when that snow will move in for Labrador. Monday's the best chance of that. Late day for Eastern Labrador, a little bit earlier on Monday for Western Labrador, and then down to the minus teens through the overnight. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look at your weather flow coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, some experts say losing your job doesn't have to mean losing control of your finances. Certain rules will keep you financially safe. And you know, there are also rules for those trying to get you to pay your bills. Al Antel of the Credit Counseling Service of Newfoundland and Labrador has this advice. So, things haven't improved. You're worried financially. You're fearing that someone is going to attach your wages. Well, first of all, here in this province, we say garnish wages. It's not garnish, it's garnishy. Garnish is actually a small town on the Bureau Peninsula or a piece of pickle attached to a ham. If your creditors decide to move against you, there's a defined process that they must follow in order to finally get access to your wages. The operative word there being wages. Your creditors cannot attach a benefit like Canada Pension, cannot attach a benefit like EI, and certainly can't attach income support. They can attach your bank account. So if you are on EI, and you're unemployed and you've been unemployed for a period of time and you've got a bunch of money owing to the bank and you get your EI check and you put it in the bank, guess what? They can take it. So one of the things you might want to consider moving your operating account to a different bank so that you don't lose your money in the event of not being able to pay your debts.
And remember, you can watch Here Now anytime. We're broadcasting live on YouTube, and you can also catch past episodes on demand. All you have to do is go to YouTube and subscribe to CBC NL. So did you get that emergency message test on your phone today? Hmm. It isn't the nicest sound, but it's an alert you need to hear. This was the second nationwide test of Canada's emergency notification system. It took place this afternoon, even in the House of Commons. The first test of the system in May only went out to about 60% of wireless users across the country and didn't work at all in Quebec. In other news, we now know how $15 million raised after the Humboldt Bronco bus crash is going to be distributed. Today, a Saskatchewan judge agreed that families who lost a loved one should receive a $525,000 payout. The judge also agreed that each of the 13 surviving players should receive $475,000 each. Now, both payouts include an interim payment of $50,000 that was approved back in August. On April 6th of last year, 16 people were killed and 13 injured when the Broncos bus collided with a truck. When a Saskatoon mother taught her two young sons how to perform CPR, she never imagined how they would actually need to use the skill. But then their grandmother went into cardiac arrest. Bonnie Allen has their story. When this Saskatoon grandmother's heart suddenly stopped, her chance of survival was low unless she got help quickly. And she did from her two young grandsons. Come over here. Do you remember how to check the pulse? The boys learned CPR just for fun this past summer from their mother, who's a nurse. Right here is the pulse. Then, a couple weeks ago, 7-year-old Grayson and 10-year-old Kyan slept over at their grandmother's house. Suddenly, she coughed and slumped over. She looked really dead. She was like, and like, spit was kind of going like, she was back drooling. into her mouth and like, uh, uh. And then she, yeah, she made coughing noises. She was grunting noises. a little. The boys were scared, but jumped into action. He checked up here for a pulse, and there wasn't one. And then... I checked here. And there wasn't one either. The boys called 911. The operator helped them along with some guidance. Remember where to push? And Kyan started doing chest compressions. Grayson pitched in with the breaths. I honestly didn't think they would ever need it, so... I just showed them the basics, where to do compressions, how to do compressions, the breaths, plugging the nose. Seven minutes later, paramedics arrived and shocked their grandma, Patty Chatterson, back to life. My oldest son, or grandson that was doing the compressions was so worried that he had broken some ribs or my sternum because his first compression, he felt a crunch. And I said, yes, you in fact did do that, but that shows me that you did proper compressions and that is what actually saved my life. The 62-year-old grandmother is recovering from cardiac arrest, and she can't remember what happened that night. She's the only one. They were very shaken up, they were distraught, but obviously they had done something amazing. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Ah. A look at this weather photo. It doesn't really give you a good idea of where it is, but I thought it was kind of nice. That's fantastic. I love those kind of Bile up. ups. <laughs> what are we going to have That's there? where That's I want to nice. be right now, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> gross morn area? No. Oh. No snow. You, no snow, but this must have been taken a while ago, but I will ha I'll tell you where that is coming up in a bit.
that photo again. Nice Didn't really get. Cup of tea outside. Yeah. There's Wait. no snow, so it has to be somewhere in the St. John's area, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except, no, this photo must have been taken uh, a little bit earlier. Yeah, Port uh, Hope Simpson oh, is where it was taken. It's a definitely a while <laughs> back. Yeah, definitely a while back. Uh, this, she calls us the tea warms any cold and day. That oh. is true. Thank you yeah. for the archival picture, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if everything you, smells so much better. There's no food on the grill, but nope. if there was food on the grill, mm, mm, mm. it's my favorite place to be. Yeah, it's yeah. like a river in the background too. Yeah. Yeah, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. <laughs> That's our program. Have a great night, everyone. Good night.